so a specialist architecture and design publisher, mostly of Australian architecture, a little bit of international stuff. But our stock here is a bit more diverse than what we publish. There's all kinds of things, even a little bit of Palm Springs modernism. <laughs> um, we, uh, before we begin today, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that this bookshop sits on Wurundjeri land, and I'd like to acknowledge their ancestors, past and present, and pay my respects to them. Um, the focus of this evening's event is the recent book, Lost in Palm Springs, um, which is an exploration of the connections between Palm Springs modernism and Australian art and architecture. Um, we're very lucky to be joined tonight by the book's author, uh, Brian Honeywell, um, who has kindly agreed to give a short presentation on the genesis of the book. Uh, as well as being an author, Greer is an award-winning multidisciplinary artist and curator whose practice encompasses installation, text, object making, textiles, photography, video and sound. It's got all the bases covered there, I think, just about. Maybe. Um, this book actually accompanies an exhibition um, which, which Greer has curated, which is currently showing at HOTA, uh, which is also called Lost in Palm Springs. And I think it might be touring at some point. It, 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 it's finished now. 21st it closed. Ah, oh, right. And it will begin its tour shortly. Right. Um, it dates <coughs> and, and places TBC. Correct. Yeah. So keep an ear out for that one. Um, she's joined tonight in conversation with Stuart Harrison. Uh, Stuart is an Australian architect and communicator um, and can be found advocating for good design across many mediums, including television, radio print, and of course, live events. Yes. Here we are. So Stuart is, is going to have a short conversation with Greer um, at the tail end of the presentation. And because we're quite an intimate space, we like to keep it pretty informal. So we're hoping that we can have a bit of a chat with the audience as well about, about the book and about Palm Springs modernism generally. Just so you're aware though, we, we are actually recording tonight's event. So that iPad is recording what's happening up here. There's also obviously um, an audio recording happening, but if you're not at, this, at the front with your face on the screen of the iPad, you're you're not going to be identifiable. So um, we may or may not include the, the Q and A at the end with the audience and the, and the recording. If you're worried about that, just let us know, and we, we won't include it. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to Bria. Okay. Thank you. I have a script, so I keep on point. <laughs> okay. What is Lost in Palm Springs about? Lost in Palm Springs is not a catalogue and it's not a treatise on mid-century modern architecture. It's the unique story of the lost curator from her first experience of Palm Springs to the published book and launched exhibition we see today. It is the story of one of the most challenging projects of my life, exploring the intersections between art, architecture and life, looking for the essence of the art of architecture and the architecture of art a journey linking Palm Springs and Australia where the voices of others join me in storytelling. So I begin my story with two quotes. First, American composer and music theorist John Cage famously declared, begin anywhere. I love that boldness, strike out and ideas will, by chance, fall into place. Maybe. Lost in Palm Springs did happen by chance, one of the most important chance occurrences in my life. In 2015, having just completed a second PhD, I was looking for the next project. At this time, Ross Honeywell, Dr. Ross Honeywell, who's behind the screen hiding, to whom I'm married, was invited to open a conference in Las Vegas. Would I like to go, he said. Las Vegas was not on my bucket list, but then it occurred to me that Las Vegas was close to Palm Springs, so I suggested we visit Palm Springs. American architect John Lautner said, the purpose of architecture is to improve human life. In Australia and America, we shared a post-war dream. While we called it the Great Australian Dream, the idea across the two nations was to create as many affordable homes as possible for the developing middle class to reinvigorate the damaged economy. The brilliance in California and Palm Springs in particular was the influence of architects. In 1949, my parents bought into the Great Australian Dream, buying an affordable red brick home in the new South Australian coastal suburb of Glenelg North. There was no hand of the architect to be seen in the design of this post-war home or any other in that suburb development. The design of this family home contributed little to the improvement of human life and even at the age of five, I knew there had to be a better place to live. 
As I grew and became more informed, uh, the theatre of the domestic and domestic architecture would become an important part of my practice. In 2015, when chance led me to Palm Springs, I had no more than 28 hours to look at the desert city, take an architectural tour and evaluate whether my findings might provide the basis for the next project. As I requested, the architectural tour centred on once affordable architect designed single family tract houses. I was immediately drawn to the clean lines of the modernist architecture and the beautiful desert gardens. Designing the domestic landscape and community streetscape is as important as the design of the built form. On the tour, there were several examples of gardens designed by William Kreisel in the latter part of his career. Kreisel is one of the architects I focus on. I was captivated by the horizontality of the architecture with extended overhangs to provide protection from the glare of the sun while glass walls afforded light, transparency and prospect. This was an ingenious response to desert living by the brilliant architects of Palm Springs. Everything was about controlling direct light while revealing the beauty, the sky, mountains, palm trees and glorious desert gardens. And this approach is echoed in pockets of architect design mid-century modern homes in the post-war suburbs of Australia. While I fell in love with Palm Springs architecture, at the same time, I experienced an overwhelming feeling of being lost, lost to the beauty and awe of the unknowable desert landscape and the sheer immensity of the collection of mid-century modern architecture. It was then that I realised that being lost was the beginning of an idea an idea I wanted to pursue. The project I came to call Lost in Palm Springs evolved in response to three artist residencies undertaken in 2017, 2018 and 2019. The plan was that during the residencies I would develop a body of work for exhibition, I would complete a body of writing narrating the story over the three years, I would use the idea of being lost as a strategy to enable discovery and during each residency, I would stay in an architect design mid-century modern home to immerse myself in the architecture. I presumed the body of work for the exhibition would be mine, but as the project moved forward, I became more interested in the work of other artists, photographers and thinkers, and moved from the role of solo artist and writer to become curator and writer. I was excited by the idea of an international exhibition and the challenge it posed. Given that Lost in Palm Springs was now becoming quite an ambitious program, what on earth made me think I could create an exhibition on my own? Why would artists, particularly American artists, believe in and want to be part of my vision? As the project progressed, I was beyond amazed and full of gratitude for the extraordinary support and trust extended by artists on both sides of the Pacific. In December 2019, I submitted a pro proposal to Museums and Galleries Queensland for an international exhibition that would tour regional Australia. They approved the project in 2020 and in turn partnered with Hotter, Home of the Arts on the Gold Coast, to bring to life the exhibition Lost in Palm Springs, which will tour five states and 11 galleries. Between the Palm Springs residencies, I researched artists and architecture in Australia looking at mid-century modern architecture at Beaumaris, Mount Eliza and Canberra, and the homes of individual subjects. For instance, in the book you will find an interview with the daughter of famed architect Sir Roy Grounds. I was playing with the idea of proximity and influence. Do the children of revered architects become architects themselves? From the age of six, Victoria Grounds lived in the Hill Street house, Turak, designed in 1953 by her father, as a home for his family, a home that would become an architectural icon. And yes, Victoria did become an architect. In Palm Springs, I interviewed Gary Wexler, son of revered architect Donald Wexler. Gary did not become an architect, rather he became a prominent graphic designer, and since 2018, his practice as an artist focusing on serigraphy. Gary was so intensely interested in the project that he designed the beautiful title typography and gifted it to the project for use in the book, the exhibition catalogue and the gallery, an immensely generous act. So what was my curatorial intent? For the exhibition I wanted to bring together creative minds who respond to, capture or reimagine the magical qualities of the landscape 
within which the celebrated mid-century modern architecture from Mount Eliza to Canberra, from Mermaid Beach to Sydney. Um, I think I missed something there. And artists, photographers from Australia who explore mid-century modern architecture from Mount Eliza to Canberra, Mermaid Beach to Sydney, and those who work back and forth across the Pacific building bridges and weaving connections. The coming together of these amazing artists both reveals and ce celebrates the many extraordinary intersections between art, architecture and life, and the many connections that exist between Australia and Palm Springs. Place and home is an overarching theme in the book and exhibition we all need shelter, a place to live and make home, a place to dream. Whether it's a vernacular coastal shack, a desert cabin, Gaston Bachelard's philosophical hut in the forest, or an architect-designed single-family home in suburbia, whatever form home takes will have an enduring effect on those who live within. While an extraordinary number of architects influenced the architecture of Palm Springs, I chose to focus on William Kreisel, 1924 to 2017, and Donald Wexler, 2020, sorry, 1926 to 2015, and contemporary architect Lance O'Donnell, principal of O2 Architecture, whose work can be seen in the book and exhibition. Of course, stories can't be told without other architects moving in and out of the narrative. Given that my aim was to complete each residency while living in a relevant mid-century modern home, I needed to find a home. For residency one, <clears throat> I chose a butterfly roof model designed by William Kreisel, built in the Racket Club Estates by the Alexander Construction Company in 1959. Home for residency two was a condominium in Canyon View Estates, also designed by William Kreisel. I wanted to experience and evaluate whether a condominium, a box-like structure set within a shared landscape influenced by Sir Ebenezer Howard's <coughs> excuse me, garden city movement could improve human life. Living in this modern condominium was so rewarding that for the third residency, I returned. Sadly, the opportunity to stay in a home designed by Donald Wexler did not present itself. If you cast a pebble into a pond, the curious will always explore the outer ripples, not just the heart of the splash. What began by chance in Palm Springs, buoyed by the ripple effect, extended to nearby Joshua Tree. Here I discovered a diverse community of creative people, including Kim Stringfellow and Blake Baxter. Joshua Tree is also the base for Bernard Lebov's Boxo Projects, a multi-program arts initiative where Melbourne-based artist Goja Vlodicek completed two residencies. Joshua Tree presents a diversity of architecture from mid-century modern to vernacular jackrabbit homesteads, the latter with a connection to Australian shacks. What draws creative minds to Palm Springs? Perhaps the landscape with its spectacular mountains of ancient granitic rock rising to form an extraordinary cinematic backdrop? or perhaps the patterned horizontality of the desert floor. Bathed in extraordinary light, the inexplicable visceral sensations stimulated by this desert place and the swirling atmospheres engendered by the restless seismic power of the landscape affect the mind, body and soul. The extreme beauty has been a magnet for artists and creative minds seeking to work and live in the peace and solitude of the desert or as travelling artists experiencing the new, exploring the unknown and allowing the atmosphere of place to influence their work. Initial interest in the sparsely populated <coughs> city began in the early 1900s when Palm Springs slowly began to grow as a health resort before being discovered in the 1920s by the Hollywood film industry. Later in the 50s and 60s, Dreamers were drawn to the vast tracts of mid-century modern homes, primarily second homes for an overwhelmingly optimistic post-war America. Second homes because at the time no one lived all year round in Palm Springs because of the intense heat. Today the desert city is something of a dream destination, a resort city where cocktails by the pool are part of daily life. On the 11th of March this year, the exhibition Lost in Palm Springs launched at Hotter, home of the arts on the Gold Coast. It closed on the 21st of this month and will soon begin its tour of regional galleries. 
So let's enter the exhibition as it was at Hotter and take a quick look at a small selection of work from the 14 artists. Works within the exhibition fall within four groupings. First, the physicality of architecture is brought to life by five exhibitors. Fine art photographer Kate Bayliss sought to capture the mid-century modern architecture of Palm Springs using infrared photography and it's one of her photographs that adorns the cover of the book. While on the right, Troy Kudlak reimagines in Palm Springs the mid-century modern homes first built across California between 1949 and 1966 by the visionary developer Joseph Eichler. Kudlak uses original plans by Eichler architect Claude Oakland, made possible by the University of California Berkeley Environmental Design Archives. David, uh, Darren Bradley, an, uh, an, an American architectural historian and photographer, playfully compared the architecture of Palm Springs to mid-century modern architecture of Canberra, where he lived part-time between 2016 and 2017. Architect Lance O'Donnell presents Rock Reach, a modest, desert-perfect, sustainable, prefabricated home built near Joshua Tree, a prototype able to be easily constructed and repeated, just as the Bauhaus espoused. And Tom Blatchford sought to capture the mid-century modern architecture of Palm Springs using the extraordinary light of the full moon. The work of Paul Davies, Anna Carey and Vicky Stavrou extends the dream into the reimagined and the fantastical. In his paintings and collages, Paul Davies uses iconic modernist architectural forms which he submerges in alternate landscapes to create fictive scenes that remain strangely recognisable and at the same time unrecognisable. In this painting, an iconic Wexler and Harrison steel house hides within a fantastical landscape. Anna Carey captures the familiar leftover architecture of the 1950s in the form of hotels, motels, apartments, and reimagines them as miniature architectural models, which she then photographs against natural or cinematic backgrounds. And Vicky Stavrou creates paintings of classic mid century modern houses in Palm Springs in richly coloured, perfect, perfectly sunlit com compositions. But she's never been to Palm Springs. Instead, she powerfully dreams the houses into existence using gathered photographs as reference. In this painting, she touches on one of the great problems of Palm Springs, the appropriate conservation of the diminishing water supply. In 2011, the city of Palm Springs set up a lawn buyback program to encourage residents to replace lawns with desert gardens. And finally, the works of Jim Iserman, Sam Cranston and Goja Vlodicek play with the power of pattern and repetition. For the last 20 years of his international art practice, American artist Jim Iserman, who has been called a pioneer of art about design, has focused on the endless possibilities of patterns, flat, textural or dimensional, stimulated by his early research into every pro pro aspect of mid-century modern design. Sam Cranston looks anew at the pattern, form, shadow and materiality of the ubiquitous mid-century modern breeze block, extending his exploration of Gold Coast building facades first begun in 2015. And Goja Vlodicek immerses herself in the act of drawing in situ, creating both interactive performance works and installations. Here we see works from her 2017 Joshua Tree residency. For California tunics, she drew on specially made clothing worn by her audience, and Modernist Conversation is a drawing in situ created through interaction with her audience at Art Palm Springs. But as they say in America, wait, there is more. Blake Baxter is based in Joshua Tree, where he creates works that are reductive, minimalist and monochromatic. In 2021, the artist collaborated with Reflex Project Space in Toowoomba, Queensland, to create a large-scale wall mural on a public site in the city. Baxter worked from Joshua Tree while a team on the ground in Toowoomba created a work to his direction. In 2023, he was invited by Hotter to collaborate on a work within the exhibition space of Lost in Palm Springs. In the book, I interview Blake in his desert studio. 
Lost in Palm Springs, the book provides many more insights into artists and their work, the journey of the curator, chance meetings, and images of mid-century modern architecture in Australia and America. <clears throat> it takes many people to bring to life an international touring exhibition, and I want to thank the wonderful staff at Hotter and Museums and Galleries Queensland for bringing the exhibition to life on the walls of the gallery. And I thank the extraordinary artists, the heart and soul of the exhibition. I congratulate Melbourne Books for bringing my story to life so beautifully. And after the next part of the presentation, I'll be here to sign books if you're interested. And I thank Bookshop by Uro and Stuart Harrison. And Stuart Harrison will now take you further into Palm Springs. Okay, let's thank Dr. Honeywell first. <laughs> and it was a fantastic condensed version of what is a really incredibly comprehensive book, which I've been spending time with over the last few days, and I do really recommend it really. Um, I'm going to reflect on a few things in relation to Palm Springs myself, and then we're going to have a bit of a discussion. So I just want to locate where I have interacted with Palm Springs, which is far more recent um, uh, than Dr Honeywell. So I, um, as an architect, recently joined a photographer, Jack Lovell, who's down here in the back of the room, um, to present the work of Ivan Ivanov in um, Palm Streams at Modernism Week. And uh, we're talking probably about Modernism Week in the book, which is an annual event celebrating architectural post-war modernism that, that's been going for getting close to 20 years, I think, in Park Springs. And Park Springs is obviously this hotbed of modernist post-war activity. We'll talk more about that in a second. But So I went there with, uh, with Jack. Jack was going to present his beautiful photographs of the work of Ivan Ivanov, who was a Perth-based um, modernist, bold, uh, born in Bulgaria, trained in Munich, moved to Perth around 1950. And did extraordinary expressive work. And we were there to see if there was parallels between the work in Palm Springs, which there were some, um, uh, particularly in sort of climatic responses. Perth gets pretty hot too, not quite as hot as Palm Springs in the summer, but still pretty hot. It still has a certain quality of light. So we were there to present and talk about this figure, largely unknown. I mean, I don't know if been an interesting figure. Um, I've been involved in, I guess, uh, promoting his work. He died in 1986. Um, and I, I studied him, uh, his work as a student in the 90s, and then recent years have been uh, working with Jack uh, in terms of the photographic work that he's done, and also um, one of the episodes of the television show I hosted, Restoration Australia, was focused on the reconstruction of an Ivan Ivanov house. I'm also involved in a virtual reality, reality project on an Ivan Ivanov. Long story, this work and Jack did a whole lot of work to get us there um, to Modernism Week. So this was an opportunity for two things really. One, to discuss this architect in particular, present this relatively unknown figure, relatively unknown in Australia until recently, nationally, very well known, but um, to present this, you know, possibly for the first time, or the first time to international international audiences, that was very exciting. But the other reason to go to Palm Springs and Modernism Week and um, all of Greer's visits that uh, elaborate on this is the excitement and the specificity of a particular place and the uniqueness of the place. Whether you're going to um, Napier in New Zealand or Venice or, or any, you're always looking for what makes a place like it is. Um, you know, in a world of genericness, we're drawn to specificity. And Palm Springs has that, even though in some ways it's a, it's, it's most of that city is a, is a post-war expansion city. It was there before modernism, as Greer puts out in the book. But it's great sort of recognisable architectural intervention occurs post-war. But the specificity doesn't really come necessarily from just that. It comes from this incredible valley plain and these mountains that surround it. And there's lots of photographs, which I think are great, in the book, which capture that beautifully. So, um, as Jack was saying, it's a hard thing to photograph, but you have this sense of enclosure, which is a weird thing to have in a desert. Because um, deserts, you normally think, in a cliche way, are sort of infinite. But in Palm Springs, you get a really great sense of being nestled and protected by these wonderful mountains. And, they, and those mountains form so many backdrops, we've seen some there, to these extraordinary houses. So the other, the second reason to be there was really to find out about this place that lots of people have talked about. And as I say to uh, 
created before. There's been a long uh, trail of Australians going to craft springs over, over recent decades. And all the really interesting things, whether it's Greer, whether it's Tim Ross, whether it's Tom Blatch, whether it's other people at the show. And, um, so it's been a really interesting engagement. I think. So I think people are drawn to it. Americans are drawn to Palm Springs as well. But there's lots of stories around the establishment of Palm Springs uh, you know, with, with Hollywood. And there's a lot of trading on the uh, celebrity uh, limelight, um, particularly in some of the houses. And Greer talks about the house of tomorrow, which you know, famously had Elvis staying in for several hours. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was the least interesting thing about this house is the fact that Elvis leased it. Um, but uh, extraordinary piece of work and one of the houses that people want to get into. And so what Modernism Week does, I think, at best is it tries to leverage that obsessive interest that the public has in. And I'm a design advocate, so this is, I do this too. It leverages that obsessive interest that people have in houses, and particularly houses of people who are famous or were famous or who are maybe dead now. Um, and try and use that as a way of getting into a larger conversation about design and the importance of design and the importance of modernism. So they're the reasons I went there, had a really interesting time, I was only there for a week, um, and then on the back of that have been, and that's one of the reasons I'm here tonight, I suspect, is because I had that exposure. But once we were there, what interests me, and, and, uh, and Greer talks about it a lot in this book, and it's really the framing uh, argument of the book, which is, it's actually about kind of standard generic housing done well. So we think it's going to be all specific and Richard Neuscher and you know and, and sort of balls and you know and the sort of future. But actually, the legacy of Palm Springs is its suburbs, is um, some of the uh, twin palms and uh, uh, the Rath Club Estate and uh, Old West Palmas and all these other ones that are actually just suburban track housing. Like, and if you sort of squint your eyes from that, you think you might be in suburban Perth. Um, but the houses are not terrible, they're fantastic. Uh, and you suddenly realise that what we have here is tracked housing, um, subdivided housing, um, as we Australia, done well. And so when we talk around the debates around housing, which is a very hot topic, one of my other roles is President of Open House Melbourne, and we advocate for good design through opening things up. We've got an open nature program running as part of Melbourne Design Week. Um, when you're talking about housing, often the conversation tends to be quite polarised between density and not density. You know, density is good, low density is bad, is the sort of very simplistic view of it. And whilst that potentially is right, it's also not how it's ever going to be. And so, what Palm Springs gives is suburban Palm Springs, not the main street, there's some nice buildings on the main street is an argument for if you're going to do that stuff, you're going to, you can do it well. And that's why I started reading the other day, uh, it's really right at the start. It's just like, it's the most beautiful, simple summary of what's important in housing. It's something around modesty of size, indoor, outdoor, landscape, amenity or prospect. And these are the things that are still important in housing. They've always been the things that are important in housing. And what we see in Palm um, Springs is a really clear way of doing that. Uh, now, it might be that if we do that today, it might not look exactly like this because this was a very much on its time. Be careful not to sort of disnify the whole thing, but the lessons, the principles of housing are still just as important. So, that great legacy, I think, because the model is broken in Australia around suburban um, housing provision, mass housing provision. So, um, Rob Boyd and others, you know, at certain periods have interacted with. Um, mass housing and improved it, small home service, he talks about a lot, or, or, or also a lot of nostalgia. Um, but none of that happens now. So we have a completely broken model now. And so my great hope with projects like this is that we could use it to advocate for well designed housing in a suburban context, um, or a context that most people are still going to live, as well as doing all the unimportant stuff around densification, well designed apartments, and other forms of housing, well located, etc. So I went to Palm Springs thinking I would see something very specific, and I did, but it was the place that was specific. The housing actually was a great lesson in how universally it can be done well. So then my sort of opening thoughts, I'm keen to get a conversation going. Um, so Greer, the personal story that you start the book with around Adelaide and, uh, and, and sort of trying to 
find a place that's you know decent to live in. But it's just almost like a human right, right? <laughs> how do we find something that we like hanging out in? How do we like being? In? Why? Okay, so the question is not why is that important to you? Because it's sort of self-evident. I think the question is why is that more important to other people? I I don't know. Um, I, I felt terribly restricted, and um, we didn't have houses on the opposite side of the road. We had a, a bank, a creek bank, and when I say creek, I mean very ordinary, plain, not attractive. But I would escape, even as a tiny kid, up the hill and walk along, and I would make up stories just to get me away from the house. Now. As a young child, how could I have been knowledgeable? It was just an instinct that there was something better. And when my dad took me to swimming classes when I was five, um, we went down the esplanade of Henley Beach. And there were all these houses. They were a lot bigger. They all had verandas that overlooked the sea and windows that overlooked the sea. OK, I didn't know that it was a suburb that had gone dead. I didn't know that people didn't want to live there particularly. I thought, in comparison, it was fabulous. And that's what started the whole thing. So from that point, I've been looking for. Yeah, and I think it's kind of a, so the, 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 if we bring it back to sort of wider idea about how do we share this enthusiasm for world site housing at a, you know, at, a, at a bigger level, I wonder what models for housing would need to be back on um, to try and bring back that knowledge, knowledge that has been lost. But, that, but know, isn't it interesting that so many architects go to Palm Springs, yes. they experience the houses, the fabulous houses and the tracked houses, um, but they don't seem to come back here and spread the word. Yeah, I think, I think that it might be a wider cultural form, but I think you, you're right. I think most black teams who go there go, this is great. Uh, these are kind of the principles I broadly agree with. But the project is almost the efficacy project. It's how you then you know, convey these things more broadly. Yes. You talk about modesty in housing size in the book, which I agree with completely. Um, the fact, the size of your uh, parental house, so your family home, which you put an area in two decimal places, which is pretty it was roughly the area of my house, um, well, it wasn't always, um, and I think that's, you know, these are not, these are, you know, there was about 116 square metres, I think, and these are not, mm. um, these are not, uh, these, are, these are the right size, this is sort of right sizing what housing needs to be, if it's well, if it's well designed, so the, the problem with the housing debate is often it can be split into very simple binaries, oh, you're advocating for small housing, yes, if it's well designed, it's always the right, right, so because what people associate with small housing is small apartments that are generally terrible, and that's and that's bad. Um, so when I did a book on housing years ago, you know the, the conclusion was around the idea that houses in Australia are too big and apartments are too small. And it's sort of there's something in between that we don't that we don't do very well, and that's still I think that's still that's that's still the case. Mm -hmm. The other observation, observation about what I wanted to make is around what is the um, and so I, I was interested in this idea of the, the lost, the lost being lost. I mean, we're all like being lost, but what's so interesting about the book is it's sort of the opposite of lost. Like, it's, there's so much in it. It's, such a, it's almost encyclopedic around an incredible history of the place, all the key players involved. So I found it, in fact, very enlightening. And as an intercounted foot, it really shared a whole of my own knowledge around Palm Springs, which would be going for you know, half a year or so seems to capture all of that stuff. So I would give this book to somebody who wanted to find out about Palm Springs. Like, who are the important architects they were working there? What's the history of the place? Why is it important? Why is it specific? Um, and how it relates to discussions in Australia when you start talking about Australian modernism as well, which are around and, and others. So I'm not saying it's a criticism, but, but I think, in fact, the book is, in fact, quite holistic in that sense. I think it started as quite a specific thing because it's a personal story. But in fact, in the end, you've written a, a sort of a, a history. I guess, I guess as the residencies went on, I was a little le less lost yeah. and more confident. And people were incredibly generous in talking to me, spending time with me, informing me. 
Um, so I guess it was inevitable that I would stop being completely lost as I was at the beginning and enjoying that to being stimulated to gradually discover and express those discoveries. Yeah, yeah. You also sort of talked about um, John Lorna at the start, the Lorna quote, and um, I guess he was, he was the kind of architect I was expecting to see there, but in fact some of his houses, like the Bob Hope House. Oh, well, you can't get to see. Yeah. <laughs> nice try. Yeah, the Richard Neutral one, you can't get to see no. either. Calvin House, yeah, you can't get to see that. And so the high, sort of capital A architecture, is actually a bit hard to, to get to. And I, I didn't really worry about that because I didn't want to talk about that. Everybody's done that. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about the ordinary and how yeah. the ordinary can be extraordinary. And I think that connection to the Australian suburban experience is, is where the book is, is just so strong. The other observation I had when I was there with, with, with Jack was this idea about, if we take a figure like Albert Frey, who I became a little obsessed with. Mm. Um, who wouldn't? The so, book talks about, it's a full history of Albert Frey. Um, and, you know, Albert Frey ended up sort of sunbaking out of his house up in the hills, one of the few houses in the hills, nude every day. <laughs> um, and he, as you point out, look, he got into it. Like, he got into the desert. Like, these were not people just borrowed from it. Like, sort of spiritual connection. Mm. Some of these migrant, European migrant architects who came to the desert and really found themselves in a way that was kind of almost new agey, but, but with an incredible translation into the workload. Like, the, 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 the Albert Frey modernism is extraordinary. Like, it actually does feel like it was supposed to be. Whereas modernism, you know, modernism normally is regarded as something that's kind of been put there. Uh, and it's sort of, it's a conceptually from the future. Whereas the Frey work looks like it was always meant to be there. Mm-hmm. In fact, it, so my experience of Frey was go and see the house, and then um, afterwards go to go and see the city hall, which is near the airport, uh, Wesley the airport, right? Uh, yes. And then Frey did the, like, the courts and the and the city hall opposite. And people you can walk to the airport, which is hilarious. It's a walking city. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. yeah, it's a rumble. But the the civic buildings, I found them. A little far fewer people have known them looking at them for a start. Mm. Speaking to someone at reception, they were like, Yeah, we don't get that many people in here. Uh, why are you in here? Um, They're all going to the Altmus house. And so, so you, you can see that in fact, you've got an artist here who's done an enormous amount of important civic work, public work, and it's not as celebrated as much. Buildings like this Palm Street and City Hall, which to put a picture in everyone's mind, has this beautiful big canopy. Stretch that's a very horizontal building and a big circular cutout in the canopy, and three palm Beautiful. trees rise through it. So it's an act of editing, it's an act of framing. And the palm trees, it just forms this remarkable combination of elements, but it also feels very much like a, a civic building, which is very happy to do. And so, you know, why isn't this work celebrated more? Because this is really cool. Some of the commercial work, interestingly, is. Off the banks, the banks, like all the former yes, banks, yes, yes. like the you know, architecture museums and a former bank the building opposite that. I forget who did that one. That's a former bank, and those. And so they're sort of um, who are some of the people in some of those ones? That the Stuart, um, Stuart, Stuart, Stuart Williams, yes. Stuart Williams section, and so those ones are celebrated um, and have been adapted and reused in a really way. But the suburbs, like the city hall, are still being used as the city hall. Mm, mm. But weirdly not celebrated. Did you have any did you have any interactions with you outside of the the world of housing? Oh, with artists, artist yeah. studios. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So that was extraordinary because every artist has a different view. And um, so just the bird life when I went to visit uh, Kim Stringfellow, you know, the birds were knocking on the window. And she took me to the window and said, look, you can, look how far you can see. And you, you could, my God. So she's up in Joshua Tree, yeah. like Black Baxter. And from his studio, you could see way across the desert and the mountains seem teeny tiny there. Yes. Very exciting. Those mountains are extraordinary, aren't they? We might open up to questions from our um, small... Uh, dedicated audience. Does anyone have any questions for Karina? Yes, you, sir. I just uh, wanted to add something to, to, to what you said. We actually went to Palm Springs many times about 25, 30 years ago, but ended up buying a... Before school. Uh, <laughs> ended up buying a house by Tellius and Architects in Scottsdale and, and Phoenix, which we had for 20 years or so, and restored. 
Fantastic. Um, yeah, and um, I think the uniqueness of Palm Springs, from my experience, is that it's framed and you get a human scale that's framed because when you go to that same architecture that Del Webb some cities on the huge scale they are in outside Phoenix, similar architecture, um, it doesn't have the same magic because it's it's just lost. endless. And it's yeah. lost yes. in, in the desert, whereas it's framed, I think. It's yeah, by the mountains, the sky, the, the trees. But it's cool. also low rise. Mm. Yes. And that's very advantageous. It, it, it is. I, th I think there's also something else that you touched upon of the adaptation to people wanting to be in the desert and you half the year you get up and you're active in the morning, you stay inside and then you live outside of the evening. Is that I think that that, that continues with people like Rick Joy in Tucson doing modern architecture like the, the one in Joshua Tree where um, we went to a project he did where this part of the house you live in, you walk through the scrub with you know animals and you go to the cooking area or the sleeping area. So that's still evolving, I think. So I, I think it is man conquering the landscape a bit. And I think in Palm Springs, that you were right, it's the framing of it in, in it that makes it a, a human scale, makes yes. it more manageable. Yes, yes. It's not like, uh, I mean, I love New York. But you go to New York and you are truly overcome by the buildings looking down on you. You become, you know, this teeny tiny person in the landscape. And you're never going to be, you're never going to find things. Of course, Palm Springs is much smaller, so it's easier to find things. But it's not the same. New York is wonderful in its own way, but Palm Springs is very different. And it's your friend. And I think part of that quality that the, the framing is that there's very few buildings in those mountains that frame the city. There are a few, but it, it generally they're not. And so if you, you read them as um, the speak natural edifice, uh, uh, because it is, it, you know, like it's not, it, whereas so many other cities, the housing continues up the mountains. Mm, mm, and mm. it sort of reads as the city mm. folding up. Mm. This reads like the city just, it just stops. Um, and I think that has an effect. So you start reading the, the mountain as itself um, and, and, and how it catches and frames and sort of turn away, it's, and it closes. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Honeywell? Yes. Yeah, I just have a question, quite a bit more of an observation, but firstly, thank you very much for, for your presentation and the book looks wonderful. Thank you. Um, I think, just, just a comment really, that Palm Springs wouldn't really exist, I think, without Los Angeles. And that you've got to look at the, the cultural influence of Los Angeles on Palm Springs, the various waves of, of I guess, residents, uh, firstly from the movie community, then right through to the 1980s, 90s, the gay community, who really sort of set Palm Springs you know, and, and put it on the map. Um, and that is all influenced by culture um, and, and, and the desire for, for the sort of open space from Los Angeles. And, and, and the climate and so on. So Palm Springs always for me feels very much Californian uh, and very much linked to Los Angeles culturally. Yes, although in the very beginning nobody was interested in it at all mm. and you needed three things. Railway, water and... What was the third thing? Power. No. Anyway, there were three things. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, will, absolutely. it will come to me. Yeah, um, gold. <clears throat> and the story is the same in Australia, it was a gold in America, and nearby. Yeah. Not, not so much dead in Palm Springs, but the other thing was <laughs> the dry air and sickness. It yes. would never have existed, so n never mind the film industry. Yeah. It was really started as a, a hospital wing essentially for people and the Alexander Construction Company who built so many houses and made it famous he moved there Alexander Senior because he needed to live in a dry atmosphere which was the same with Phoenix with the, the tag on they often had was take your sinuses to Arizona <laughs> because it was uh, it was drying until they planted all the trees in yeah, the until they planted all the trees but then I do agree with you it is it is as it developed linked and when the film industry came in, that's, that's the link because the film stars couldn't go more than a designated distance from the studio. And palms designated time. And designated time and distance. And, Two hours as you put out in the book. And they, um, 
they could do that with Palm Springs and the media wouldn't follow them at the time because if the media did and wrote nasty stories about them, they couldn't get back to publish those stories at the newspaper. It was also old-fashioned at the time. Now, of course, you could, but well, at the time, not. You, I completely agree. It's intrinsically linked to LA and the growth of LA, and, and, and then the later on was the development of the Coachella Valley more broadly. But what's interesting is that um, it's partial, I think you touched on this a bit, Chris, that it's partially the neglect the fact that Palm Springs becomes less fashionable in the 80s, but helps save. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Conservation through decline. Yes. And so you get in country towns in Australia a little bit too. But when the money moves on, there's less incentive to knock things down. And so there are, there's a fair bit of stuff that's heritage protected there now. Um, a lot there isn't. But, but there was a point there where it was, all, it was highly protected. It was not desirable, even though it was still only two hours from LA. It's still two hours from LA. It has moved. And it then it became fashionable again, um, and through the wider technology and design industry, and that's been a great thing. But it really, it could have, it could have gone the other way. Oh yes, if, yes, if, yes, yes. If, if people go, oh, the Palm Street's still, still sort of going great guns, all that stuff could have been knocked down, and we could have had a very different place. Mm. To, uh, mm. We could have had a, you know, basically a Spanish mission photo tower, mm. um, quite easily, like so many other places in, in Southern California. So. Interesting the ways, the pathways to preservation um, sometimes, not to the ones you might think about. Mm. Any other questions for Dr. Honeywell? Thoughts, comments? Jack, do you want to add anything? Jack Lowe was a good photographer. Mm. Did a great job, got the presentation, so thank you. Really thank interesting you. to get your perspective on it. Thank I, you, Jack. I must admit, I just want to comment about uh, photographs. Um, and I was it's my that. iPhone. Uh, yeah, I read yeah, they listed all the iPhone models, in fact. Yes. Because um, uh, I was like, I read all the photographer credits here, and then I thought, hang on, where is that? Because some of them, are, they're good photos. I mean, you know. Um, it's I, interesting that you say that, because Donald Bates, who did one of these events with me, um, Professor Donald Don't Bates, the no, he said he loved the photographs, and I said, well, look, it's easy to... It's hard to take a bad photograph. You've got the beautiful sky yeah, tree. Like too. You've got the shape of the architecture. And uh, he said, no, 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 no. You were collaborating with the landscape. <laughs> Wasn't that nice? I love that. It's so poetic. Yeah, I think it, I think, I think it is. I mean, I, I was there taking photos with my iPhone jack because I was taking photos with this very expensive camera. And, and, and you do get a bit of a head. Well, the photos I took were sort of passable, and and certainly the ones you, you you've taken here. So I think it's great that you, it's your eye we're seeing here. Uh, and you talk about the, the incidental nature of these photos, and they're not sort of highly posted in some ways, but they are very attractive. So it's given me it's given me hope as an amateur photographer. But it is it's kind of hard to take that photo past week because. Particularly when that lights out and that mountain is, you know, in the backdrop. Yes, I could arrive at a place that I wanted to photograph at the wrong part of the day and the sun was in the wrong place and, oh, oops. Or there were trucks of gardeners um, attending to gardens and there was no way you could get anywhere near the house. So, you know, it wasn't always easy. If we talk about photo for photographs, we should mention Tom Blatcher's photos because, as you have, them and, and worked with... Tom, and there's one of them in here. Um, they are a remarkable series. Yeah. Of Tom, Tom is going to be forever regretting what he did because it's become a seminal body of work and everybody will want to go because he captured Palm Springs so well. In a new way. With the and light so of the full moon yeah. and the, uh, the cars out the front of the house, um, the designer cars. Um, People keep wanting to return to that. It's going to drive him mad. Like other artists who have done great bodies of work and that people just want them to keep doing more and more of the same thing. <laughs> but of course the artists don't want to do that. Can I, I just add a comment on, on our 30 years of going there, the extraordinary thing is that at one point the downtown really had given up on it. It was, it was shuttered. Yes, and, yes. And everything had moved out to Cathedral City and, and people stayed out at um, the big resorts, the 30s resorts. 
when, and it, it was the interesting thing is when downtown came back, it was very design led and appreciation of design, yeah. which is um, had been a small group of enthusiasts like that, but it kind of caught that wave when it came back. Mm. It's quite remarkable now to stay downtown compared to 30 years ago when you know you could fire a cannon and not have to <laughs> and all the stores were shuttered. Yeah. And that, that had a cycle in itself that came back. It had gone to the suburbs and you know that, that happened so often in American cities. But you know also the, the other thing is that um, I hate the drive from LA to Palm Springs. I <laughs> and so we tend to go to Phoenix and drive through the right. desert to right. reach it from there, right. which is a different experience. Well, when you come out of the desert into it, rather than from the city. That drive from LA is interesting because it's it, it's sort of horrific, right? Like it is it is the it is the twentieth century city, just in all of its kind of uncontrolled and um, horrific you know, architecture. Yeah, well, it's it's, it's the road and, and the and everything at the side of it, and in that in that order, I guess, sort of conceptually. And you go, well, this is not unlike an Australian city in some ways, but it's just. It's just like, it just, it just doesn't stop. Mm. You actually realise it's effectively one city, and it's just this never ending. 20 million. Yeah. And it's just like, this is kind of uh, terrifying. And then you go, yeah, maybe some of the world is actually really terrible. Um, and it, it's, it, it, it most of the time it is, but it perhaps to be found somewhere where it wasn't. Um, join me uh, with Dan King, Korea, Honeywell. Um, <laughs> Thank you to Stuart. Yes, thank you to uh, <laughs> thank you.